So what are these methods and purposes for listing responses? Let's talk about that. Our objectives here are one, not surprisingly, to learn the methods for listing responses, and two, guess what? To learn the two key purposes for listing responses. I think it will make sense to you. Before we get into all of that, let's put this in context in terms of the DBI framework. As you know, we're thinking about explicit instruction as an intervention adaptation. Something you do when you realize that the secondary prevention program isn't working for students. And as we've already said, it's possible that the, inter uh, the uh, secondary prevention program isn't working because it doesn't have enough explicit instruction or it hasn't been described that you need to use explicit instruction, so perhaps you haven't been using those techniques enough. And so the adaptation you make then is to use the explicit instruction principles more. And we're going to talk about how to do that in terms of now eliciting response, which is a critical aspect of intervention adaptation for, uh, with, uh, for explicit instruction. So in terms of our checklist, let's first talk about this piece of using listening responses to maintain or check accurate proce accuracy processing. This is a critical purpose of this. So let's talk about this in terms of that idea. We mentioned already that the goal here is for students to be engaged. And we talked about engagement, meaning students having their effort focused on the lesson content really specifically. And so there are a variety then of response formats we can use to maximize student engagement in the lesson. These are not the only ways to listen responses in the world. There are many others. And we'll recommend to you a book uh, called Explicit Instruction, which surprisingly, uh, by uh, Anita Archer and Charles Hughes, which you've already seen before, a clip of Dr. Archer. Um, and they have many other methods to listen responses. But these are some of the ones we're going to use in this uh, module to give you a sense of the kinds of ways you can elicit those responses. I'll give you an example. I'll give you descriptions of each of these briefly, and you'll see them further on in the module. So whip around is one of my favorite techniques to very quickly get every student to participate. You ask a question where students could give a variety of responses. You go up and down the rows, or around the U, or whatever, how, around your small group, however you're doing your lesson. And you ask students to give your responses without any interruption. I often tell them to say something, think of something in 10 words or less. Sometimes give them a moment to write it down, and then give them an opportunity to uh, say their response. I usually tell students, well, if they, someone's already said it, it's OK. You can just say it again. They can, however, pass if they wish to. What I love about this technique is that it actually gets a lot of ideas on the table really quickly. It's a great way to summarize what's been learned in a certain section of a lesson. It's also a great way to talk about something that students have a lot of prior knowledge about. One of my good examples of this is that I did a lesson where I asked students to tell us what they knew about pirates before we started a lesson. And then I did a quick whip around about what do we know about pirates. And of course, students have many ideas about what pirates are. Choral response are another great way to list a response, and one I recommend you use very often. And this works even through middle school. In high school, it can be a little trickier. But the idea of a choral response is to ask a question, allow a short amount of thinking time, and then ask everyone to respond after a signal, putting your hands out or something like that. You saw a video of Dr. Archer doing that exact thing in the, uh, mod the video we watched in Module 5. And so that's a great way of getting all the students engaged at one time. They all give this response. It only works for certain kind of responses, though, a point we'll come back to later. Hand signals are another great way to get all students involved at the same time. So for example, you ask a question, you allow a little thinking time, as we described, you'll do for all of these methods, and then give a clear signal for how students will respond to you when they get when you sort of signal for them to do so. And you can do thumbs up, thumbs down, fist to five. This meaning I don't understand something at all, and so on. Five meaning I have a complete understanding or complete knowledge of a certain topic. And then using fingers as numbers, and they say, you know, hold up a one if you think the answer is this one, hold up a two if you think the answer is this, think the answer is this one. Cued retail is a great strategy for getting students to, with a partner, remember what's been taught. So with cued retail, when you've, let's say, taught a series of things, a list of things, you want students to remember all of them, but you know that they're You've learned, they've learned a lot of stuff and they might not remember everything. You then have them work with a partner and they can think of all the things that they know. The partner then cues them, gives them hints if they don't know the answers. And then after that, they switch jobs and the other student provides the prompts if students need support. Whiteboards are a great way to get students to all give an answer. And probably at some point in the future when people watch this module, because perhaps they'll watch it for many, many years or not, but whatever. 
Uh, you probably just draw on an iPad or some other tablet-like tablet -like thing. But for now, in the history of teaching, we're talking about whiteboards. And basically, it's a way for students conveniently write their answer on uh, a board so that they can all share that at the same time, hold it up for the class. Um, it's an often a nice way to do a math problem. It can be used for a variety of other purposes as well. They all, at the same time, when you signal, put up their, uh, their board. Response cards are similar in some ways to doing the numbered responses. And so you can have there, for example, a 1 and a 2, or an A and a B, and students can hold up the one that corresponds with the answer. Uh, you could also have specific answers written on the response cards uh, if you chose to do that. There are actually special response cards now. You can actually get an app for and you can actually use an iPad or something like that to scan the room to see if the actual answers are correct, because you can put a barcode, a QR code, on the actual response card. That's pretty fancy, and I'm sure in the future there'll be even fancier ways to do this. But Response card is a nice way to very quickly get a snapshot of what students are understanding about, uh, the, con about the concept you're teaching. Turn and talk is probably the way of listening response I use most often. This is an opportunity for students to get into the content with a partner in slightly more detail than you could with a lot of these other methods. And so basically, you ask a question, give students a chance to think about it a little bit, and ask them to talk with their partners about their answers. It's a great way to get all the students engaged at the same time, give them a chance to learn from their peers. Because partner learning is one of the best evidence-based strategies for students with disabilities, students who need intensive intervention. Stop and John is a great way to very quickly get students to think about something. So you've taught a certain amount of content. And basically, after a long period, hopefully not too long a period, and we'll say more about not using too long a period of teacher talk, you ask a comprehension question and then ask students to uh, jot their thinking about that. Sometimes you call it a quick write, for example, as well. It's a nice way to students to uh, synthesize what they've learned thus far, and they can think about that. Another term for something similar would be pause and process, which would be opportunity to kind of synthesize as well. And finally, you have the individual response, which is the most common, the classic way of listing responses in which you have students basically give you answers one by one. I'm going to say more about this later, but I want to preview for you that I'm not a great fan of individual response, and I'll say why more later. I want you to think about the potential problem with uh, individual responses in terms of engaging all students. Think about that for a second. What might be the problem with individual responses in terms of engaging all students? Pause the video for a second and sort of reflect on that question. I'm going to hold my hands like this, pause the video, come back, and we'll talk about it. Well, hopefully you didn't make me hold my hands like this for too long. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, terrible joke. Um, but the idea here is that one problem with uh, individual responses is that students aren't all engaged at the same time. You're asking one student a question. They're giving a response. As you saw in the video of Ms. M at the beginning of this module, that resulted in student engagements or declining pretty rapidly. We don't want that to happen. And so individual responses have a lot of risk there. I'm going to say more about that later. Um, an alternative that I like for an individual response is a cold call, which is a way to get students to very quickly give you answers. It only works well if students are prepared. It's a good way to activate students' prior knowledge of a topic. It's not a good way to have students tell you something that you just taught that they may not understand very well yet. One way to get students, to give students the option to participate is to do something I sometimes call a friendly cold call. You know, students kind of put a thumb on the desk or have some way of indicating they feel prepared to give an answer without having to raise their hands and kind of distract the airspace of the lesson. And if you do that, then you, give you can call on students, but you don't put students on the spot if they're not ready to give you an answer. So these are a variety of different ways of listing responses. And some of these you probably already use in your classroom. So uh, pause the video now, and in your workbook, circle the methods of the ones that I described that you already use, and maybe circle twice the ones you use a lot. And maybe a question mark, and someone say, well, I don't know if I use it that much, and sort of leave blank, I guess, the ones that you don't use. Uh, and that'll give you a hint about things you might want to change. So pause the video, do that in your workbook, and we'll come back together. Now step off the screen, you do that, come back, I'll come back on. Okay, so presumably you had a chance to uh, think about the ones that you use frequently and the ones that you don't. And one thing to think about throughout this module is which ones you might target. Those two you might target for your lesson that you want to use more often. And this might be a way to think about when you get to your journal entry, which ones do you wish you'd use maybe in a recent lesson. Let's talk about now the purposes 
processing these responses. So we gave you a bunch of formats. That's wonderful. There are different ways to do it. Why are we doing this? There are two, two, two reasons that we do uh, holistic responses. One, as we've already said, is to maintain processing. Sometimes I describe this as keeping students' heads in the game. So as you're going, making sure that they're with you, thinking about that line of Ms. M's lesson, if we should be able to maintain processing, student engagement would have sort of stayed at the same level throughout the lesson. Whereas, in fact, it didn't because students weren't uh, sort of be able to maintain the processing because she didn't elicit response in a way that was effective for the students. Another way, another reason to list response is to check accuracy of processing. And not all methods of listening response are particularly good at checking the accuracy of the processing. For example, and I'll say more about this later, um, you might not always be able to use something like a core response to get accuracy because it's a very quick way of doing it. You'll see more about that in just a second. Before we talk about that one, let me talk about this one. So in terms of maintaining process, you want to involve students as often as possible. You want to, during modeling in particular, elicit at least a response at least four times a minute, and during practice, me, you know, greater than once a minute. And one way to think about this, and you'll see, you saw the timer clicking away here, and suddenly a red flag. The reason that was there is that you can see I was thinking about whether or not it's been a minute, and whether or not I've been eliciting a response. And if I haven't elicited a response within a minute, it's a red, it's a big red flag here. Why is it a red flag? Why is it important to elicit responses so often? Think about that for just a second. You can say it with me, because you need to what? Maintain processing. If you don't have students responding frequently, then you may not be able to maintain that processing. That's a really critical idea. And that, again, results in keeping students' heads in the game. It may not tell us whether or not they're totally understanding, but give us a picture of whether or not they're essentially with us and sort of able to engage in the content as we teach it. So let's take a look at maintaining processing during a model and to see how often you can elicit responses during the model. So I want you to watch this video and answer these questions about what types of methods you see the teacher use of the ones that we described. Think about how often you see the t teacher listed those responses. Think about whether the rate meets that criterion we set for four times a minute in terms of uh, eliciting responses frequently. And we'll come to that together and evaluate the model. I'll step off the screen so you can watch the video without being distracted by me sitting here and smiling or looking at the video. Uh, and so you can think about how often this happens. You may notice a similarity between the person in this video and the person here. But that's because this is me. So you're seeing me do a demonstration lesson in a sixth grade classroom. Um, in which students are learning uh, new vocabulary words. So you're going to get a sense of how I teach that lesson. So let me stop off the screen, you watch the video, and we'll come back together and talk about the answers to these questions. I also want to share with you a couple vocabulary words that are going to be in the story. OK. So the first word is exhibit. What's the word? Exhibit. Great. An exhibit is a display. What is it? A display. In this case, we're talking about display like at a museum. So when you go to a museum, they have lots of what? Exhibits. Exhibits. Displays where they show you things and you can walk around and see those things. Great. The second word is disembark. What's the word? Disembark. Disembark means to get off. What does it mean? Get off. And it means to get off like a boat. Like in this example, these are shoulders and they are, what are they doing? They are getting off or disembarking. What are they doing? They're disembarking. Here's another example of people um, getting off of a ferry. So they're what? Disembarking. They're disembarking from the ferry. That's right. In the text today, um, the girl and her family go to visit the Ellis Island Museum. They have to take a ferry to get there. When they arrive on Ellis Island, what do they do? Disembark. They disembark from there. OK, good. OK, so you got to really get a nice picture here of how often a, a responses are listed. And you probably now have a sense already the answers to the questions. So let's talk about them. So um, let me go back. Sorry, that's for a different video. So in this video, the first question I'll go back here. What types of methods did the teacher used to list responses? You saw mostly what? It was choral response. You saw the teacher do lots of choral responses throughout the video, asking the questions, getting the students all to respond. How many times are response elicited? Well, you can see there's a, so going too far. There's a whole, bunch of, uh, whole bunch of times. I can't remember. I think it's eight times during the minute. So it definitely meets our criterion of at least four times in a minute during the model, getting students to participate. And core response is great to use during a model because it's a very quick way 
getting students to respond without taking too much time from your model. Because remember, you've already said in module five, a model is where you're doing the work. And so you don't want to distract attention from your model, but you want to do what? What's the purpose of those four types responding four times a minute? To what? That's right, it's to maintain processing. If you didn't say that with me, you should say that now. Everybody, maintain processing. That's the goal of this. Okay, so go a little more casual for this one. It's elementary school, so this is what you do. Um, and so here, let's talk about maintaining processing during a different part of the lesson, guided practice. Think about already how many times do we mention you want to elicit responses at least during guided practice. What was that number that we targeted before? It was greater than or equal to one, if you don't remember the alligator sign, I think it was going this way, uh, with a line underneath. So greater than or equal to once per minute. And so again, let's look at the types of methods that the teacher uses. How many times does this, and does this meet the criterion in terms of being at least once per minute? So go ahead and watch this video. Again, I'll step off the screen and see if we can answer these questions. We'll come back together and we'll answer them. This time we do it together. You're going to catch the word and move your tokens, and then you can check with me. Here we go. The word is munch. I like to munch on potato chips. Catch it. Munch. 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 Move your tokens to show those phonemes. Double check with me. Mm, uh, mm, mm, munch. munch. Good. Give me a thumbs up if you got that. Excellent. Okay. So first of all, let's look at um, what types of methods she uses. You can see a variety of methods here. What would you say is kind of the primary method that she used? I say she relied on a lot of gestural responses and uh, sort of like the you know thumbs up, thumbs down, the catch it sort of thing, having students move their tokens. Um, so she had a lot of different responses involved, using a card and moving things around, showing her how they're doing, using their hands. How many times does a student teacher listen responses? She does at least four ways of listening responses there, and that rate certainly meets our criterion of once or more per minute. So obviously you can see here two different examples of how teachers have uh, uh, maintained processing throughout the lesson. You can see, particularly in this case, we can see the students, they're certainly engaged. Every single one of them seems to be following along in the lesson. Uh, in the video that I did, you can't see the students, but I can tell you from having taught the lesson that they were, in fact, engaged throughout. Okay. That was the first purpose, to maintain processing. Now let's talk about the second purpose, which is to check accuracy of processing. So a common way of describing this idea is to, is to check for understanding, right? And we want to check for understanding because we don't simply want to teach the lesson and blithely go on our way. We want to see if students are actually getting it. We want to do what we refer to as formative assessment. Formative assessment is assessment you do routinely to get a sense of where students are and what you need to do next. Because then you can adapt your instruction within the lesson based on student response. That's a critical purpose of listening responses is often to check the accuracy of the processing. So now let's look at a curriculum example. Our nifty folder here indicates we're looking at a curriculum example. So when we do this now, let's talk about uh, whether or not we're checking accuracy of processing in the way that we do this. So here was the original lesson from uh, the curriculum that shall remain nameless here. This was lesson 54, exercise 6. And in this lesson, the learning outcome was for students to draw inferences and note details in the particular paragraph. And the instructions to the teacher were to tell students that after you read this section without making more than two errors, we'll make some inferences and note some details. My concern about that objective is that uh, the learning outcome involves multiple things here. We've talked about the fact that there should be singular learning outcomes, lesson objectives. So we've modified this. And what we've said here is that students will be able to answer questions to identify key details, which gets us this idea of noting details. And we're skipping for now the inference piece. Why? Because one thing about reading comprehension is that students need to understand what's called the text base, which is that students don't understand uh, the individual sentences, the individual parts in the text. They won't understand the whole piece of it. They won't be able to sort of summarize and synthesize what they've learned. So we're, now the instructions we've designed here are to read the story in parts. Now, to read each part, stop to answer questions to check our understanding. This is a good example of the exact kind of thing we'll see in secondary prevention programs. 
This isn't a bad idea. It's not about any digital inferences or to know details. However, if we're thinking in terms of a good explicit instruction lesson, this isn't the way to approach that. And so we want to design our lesson somewhat differently. And this is what we've come up with. So here's the text that we were given in Lesson 54, Exercise 6. And now let's talk about how we're going to meet our learning outcome of answering questions to, as we described, establish the text base. So I'm going to read this aloud as a teacher. And you can follow along as the students slash participants in this lesson. Um, and we'll go from there. George pushed the shovel into the ground. Clink. He tossed the dirt aside, and there it was, the corner of a treasure chest. OK, everyone. So first question for you is, what did George's shovel hit? On your whiteboard, write what George's shovel hit. Those of you at home, you can write on a piece of paper, pretend you're on a whiteboard. All right, hold your whiteboards. Everyone show me what did George's shovel hit. I see here, everyone wrote, the treasure chest. Very nice. OK, uh, great thinking about what the shovel hit. Nadine began to dig. Slowly, the dirt was cleared from the chest. It was rusty, and there were a couple of holes in it. George put his finger into one of the holes, and he brought out, uh, then he brought out a round coin. It looked like a black penny. All right, let's talk about that part of the text. So my first question is, what did George find in the hole? Everyone, you can scan the paragraph again, and then write on your whiteboard what George found in the hole. I'm going to get out of the way of the text. Whiteboard's up. And you should have said, oops, uh, you should have said he found a black penny. My next question is, how did he remove the coin? So look at that same paragraph again and see if you can find the answer, how he actually got that coin out of the, uh, out of the uh, chest. Right on your whiteboard. So you should have said that he, and I see that most folks did, um, he put his finger into one of the holes. That's right. Um, Aside for those of you imagining I'm actually teaching this lesson, I would, uh, in this imaginary example, I'm assuming some students didn't get that question correct. And so that suggests to me that that's something I need to reinforce with them right now. It also suggests to me that that's something that I need to be aware wasn't clear to students. And it's partly because I asked the end question first, perhaps. But it's also because um, it's sort of embedded here uh, in the question. It's really not clear because he put his finger in the holes. It doesn't say he took it out. That's an inference. And so um, we need to sort of get at that idea for them. So time in, back to the lesson. So again, I'm going to reinforce uh, the point of the answer to this question. So how did he remove the coin? So if I look back at the paragraph, it says that George put his finger into one of the holes and brought out a round penny. So I know that he put his finger in, he brought out the penny. So that's how he what, everybody? He, that's right, removed the coin. All right, next paragraph. We'll do these two, the short one with dialogue and then the last one. What's that, Lily asked. George said, I'll show you what that is. He rubbed the coin on the leg of his pants. Then he held up the coin. It was shining like the sun. It was bright. It was, everybody, gold. All right, let's answer some questions about that paragraph. So how did George remove the black from the penny? Look back and then write on your whiteboard how he removed it. You should have said he rubbed it on the leg of his pants. Everyone said that. That's great. I like how some people wrote in a short way, said something like rubbed on leg of pants. That's great to make it nice and short. Now our last question is, what did they find? I think we all know the answer to that one. Pause for just a second. Think about it and look back. We'll all say the answer together. Everybody, the answer is? That's right, it's gold. Very nice. For those of you at home, I assume you also got the answer. It does help us probably that written in capital letters. So now you get a picture of how we've decided to check the accuracy of processing. So you notice there I didn't use a core response in this case. Why didn't I use a core response? Because a lot of these questions, perhaps I could have asked students to use a core response. So think about that for a second. What's the advantage here of doing it in the way that I just described? I'll pause for a second. Think about that. Answer it to yourself. What is the advantage of using the whiteboards? So having paused the video and thought about that for a moment, or perhaps you just were so fast in thinking of the answer, you didn't even pause. My answer to that question is that if I do a core response, I'm not entirely sure which students are getting the answer and which students might be simply sort of um, parroting everyone else's responses, listening for half a second before, before they say uh, what everyone else says, or perhaps even sort of mouthing the answer to the class.
Now, even if students do that kind of thing in the midst of a in the midst of the lesson where I'm trying to maintain processing, that's going to be okay. Partly because um, they're still engaged in the lesson, they're attempting to answer the question, and also because. If I know which students might have difficulty with a topic, I'm already focusing in on which students might need the most help around a particular topic. So that, though, is not an appropriate way to check accuracy because it's every student at once in a way that I can't actually determine which students are getting it and which are not. And I chose whiteboards because I can scan the room and I can note for myself which students are getting the answer and which ones are not. And so that's a good way to not simply maintain, but to check accuracy processing. You see here now that there are different degrees to which some of these methods are designed to maintain processing or to check accuracy processing. And so one thing that I think is useful to think about here is that ones that are good for maintaining processing often uh, require very quick responses. Because when we're maintaining processing, we're trying to keep the lesson going. And if we stop and we check accuracy, that's a good thing, but it's not simply maintaining processing. It's not keeping students' heads in the game as we move forward in the content. It's pausing and establishing that students understand. So for example, a whip around can be used to maintain processing, but because every student gives an answer, it also helps us check accuracy. Not in necessarily lots of detail, students could repeat answers, and so that could, I could infer then some students don't totally understand, but it's still a good way to uh, sometimes check accuracy, to a certain degree check accuracy. Correspondents are not good at checking accuracy for the reasons I just described in terms of our curriculum example. Hand signals can be used to maintain processing, you can get a quick response, and with the, they can also be used to check accuracy because you can scan the classroom and see which students are putting up their right fingers or not. Often teachers will have their students hold them in front of their uh, shirt or something like that in order to make sure that it, you, they're just responding themselves and not sort of looking at other students. Not that they're trying to cheat, but they're trying to participate and sometimes they sort of get the anxiety, feel the need to look. So if they hold it in front of themselves, that is eliminated. So that's a nice way to sort of then check accuracy of processing. A cued retail is not a good way to maintain processing because you're stopping the lesson essentially to do this. You're doing it to summarize a certain part of the lesson. It's really designed to check accuracy. Maintain, whiteboards can be used in both ways. Sometimes you get a very short whiteboard response. Response cards, you can imagine the same thing. They hold up the card. That can maintain processing. But because you can see everybody, you can check accuracy. Turning and talking is primarily check accuracy because students are engaged in conversation with each other. With each other. They'll check each other's accuracy. You can target the students you want to focus on so you know certain students are going to struggle more with a certain topic, you go and listen into them. Occasionally, I use turn and talk to maintain processing with a very quick turn and talk, but primarily I use it for that. Stop and jot is generally to maintain processing, but if I am walking around, I can see students' responses, I get a sense of where students are, so I can sometimes use that to check accuracy. I particularly use it, though, because it's quick to, to uh, maintain processing. Finally, the individual responses can serve that purpose, particularly if, as we described, you're doing the cold call type of responses where it's very quick. Then you're maintaining processing in that way, and you're checking accuracy. But you're not checking accuracy for everyone unless you do it for every student in the class, in which case it's almost like a whip around. So think about that when we get to deciding what types of responses to elicit. You now have a nice sense of how these different methods fit into our framework of maintaining processing and checking accuracy. Both of those are valid reasons to elicit responses and to do it often, but we have slightly different purposes depending on the place that we are in the lesson. Okay, so let's pause and process for a second. So I want you to think about those two purposes. I just said them. Write that in your own words and write why it is that those are two valid purposes and how they're different. So pause the video, stop the video, Take a break, pause and process, good chance to stretch your legs, get up and take a drink of water or whatever, and come back and we can talk about it together. So I'll pause here. You can, I'm going to stand here and wait for you. And when you're ready, come on back. OK, so presumably you paused and processed. And so as I already said, I would say that the Purposes are one, to maintain processing, to keep students' heads in the game, and also to maintain, a to check accuracy of processing. 
They're different in that one allows you to see if students are getting it. That's checking accuracy. One just kind of keeps students with you. That's the maintaining processing. Um, but both are valid purposes for listening responses because they both keep students engaged in the lesson. And one, the checking accuracy also gives you a sense whether it's a nice form of formative assessment. So now we've talked about the two ways, or two purposes of listening responses. You now have a sense of them. You now have a sense of some different methods for doing it. Let's watch our lead teacher for this uh, video, Ms. Pollack, who's a third grade special educator. She's teaching a geometry lesson about shape properties. The learning outcome here is for students to identify polygons that are quadrilaterals. I want you to look for three things. Well, three things, not five. Three things. One, Ms. Pollack maintaining processing. Two, Ms. Pollack um, checking accuracy processing. And three, Ms. Pollack doing a non-example, which is neither of those things. So watch the video, see if you can figure out how she does those things. So I'll pause, I'll step off the screen, and you can watch Ms. Pollack, and then we'll come back together. So enjoy Ms. Pollack's lesson. Today, we're going to be talking about quadrilaterals. A quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. Show me on your fingers, how many sides does a quadrilateral have? Four, that's right, a quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. We're gonna look at some shapes today and decide whether or not each shape is a quadrilateral. The first shape we'll look at is a square. What shape, everyone? A square, that's right. This square has four sides, one, two, three, Four. This square is a quadrilateral because it has four sides. Let's look at this rectangle. How many sides does this rectangle have? Show me on your fingers, everyone. Good. You should be showing me that this rectangle has four sides. Here they are. One, two, three, and four. Is this rectangle a quadrilateral? Yes or no? Good, yes, it is a quadrilateral. Turn and tell your partner why this rectangle is a quadrilateral. I heard some good discussions. This rectangle is a quadrilateral because it has four sides. Let's look at this trapezoid. This trapezoid has how many sides, everyone? Show me on your fingers. Four, that's right. One, two, three, four. Is this trapezoid a quadrilateral, yes or no? Yes, you're right. Turn and tell your partner why this trapezoid is a quadrilateral. That's right, everyone, because it has four sides. Let's look at this last shape. This is a triangle. How many sides does this triangle have? Show me on your fingers. Three, that's right. I'll show you one, two, three. Is this triangle a quadrilateral? Yes or no? I see a lot of people showing me no. Turn and tell your partner, why is this triangle not a quadrilateral? That's right. This triangle is not a quadrilateral because it has three sides, not four. Great job. A quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. This is a square. This square is a quadrilateral because it has four sides. One, two, three, and four. This is a rectangle. The rectangle is a quadrilateral because it also has four sides. One, two, three, four. This is a trapezoid. The trapezoid is a quadrilateral because it has four sides. This is a triangle. Is this triangle a quadrilateral? Yes or no? Good, I see a lot of people telling me that it is not a quadrilateral. Why is it not a quadrilateral? Turn and talk to your partner about why it is not a quadrilateral. Good, I heard a lot of people telling me that the triangle is not a quadrilateral because it only has three sides, not four. Now I want you to take out your whiteboards and draw an example of a polygon that is a quadrilateral. I'll give you about 15 seconds to work on that, and then I'll ask you to show me your boards. Today, we'll be learning about quadrilaterals. Look at the board. 
A quadrilateral is a polygon with four sides. I've given you each a worksheet today to work on. On the worksheet, you will go through and circle the polygons that are quadrilaterals. Once you're done circling all the shapes or polygons that are quadrilaterals, turn the page over and draw a shape that is an example of a quadrilateral. I'll collect these at the end of class. So you've gotten three nice examples to contrast the different purposes of uh, listening responses. And uh, let's talk about how that worked. In the first example you saw, Ms. Pollock give lots of different ways of maintaining processing. She did thumbs up, thumbs down. She did uh, choral response quite a lot. And she used these methods to elicit student responses. And those were maintaining processing. You can see that she did it many, many times. She definitely exceeded that criterion of four times per minute. She thinks in her lesson that she's focusing on maintaining uh, processing. I think you could argue that she's also checking for understanding. She's also uh, determining whether students are processing the content because as you see, she was able to scan the room when students were doing their thumbs up, thumbs down and see whether students were getting it. She also did a turn and talk somewhere in there. And if she were walking around the classroom, that would be another opportunity case in which she was checking accuracy of processing. The second example was more clearly an example of checking accuracy of processing because the things that she had students do, particularly using the whiteboards and turn and talk, turning and talking, and I know from having talked with Ms. Pollock, her intention was to circulate the room, this is me circulating the room, um, and uh, talk, watching to see if students are actually getting it and focusing in on the students that she's most concerned about. The third example was a non-example, and it was partly a non-example because the lesson is not really a lesson on that's designed in the way we want to see an explicit, ex explicit instructional lesson design. She simply gives a clear explanation. It is pretty clear, um, but she does not give any planned examples, and she doesn't give that example. She doesn't give multiple examples, of course, as a result. She moves straight to independent practice. When she moves to independent practice, she has not had any w opportunity to maintain processing because she skipped all of that. She skipped the model entirely. She simply told the students the information. And then she went on in the independent practice to check the accuracy processing with the worksheet and with having students write the quadrilateral on the back of the page. But because she has not checked students' accuracy processing throughout the lesson. She hasn't used methods to maintain processing that perhaps also check understanding. She, we have no clarity that students will actually understand this content. I like that third example, not because it's a good example, but because it's a common thing that teachers do, is to move too quickly to independent practice on the presumption that with a very simple, clear explanation that was clear, students are going to get it. And often, as we've already said, for students with, who need intensive intervention, those students are not going to be able to respond simply by us explaining things clearly and then doing something like a worksheet. They need us to move methodically through the instruction process. And while we're doing that, maintaining processing and checking accuracy, by the time they come to the independent practice, we've given them multiple opportunities to respond, where we maintain the processing, where we check for the understanding, and we've, uh, we check the accuracy of the processing, and then independent practice would be a beautiful opportunity for students to really demonstrate on their own the accuracy of processing. So in three nice examples. Thanks, Ms. Pollock, for those. So now, in activity 6.4, you have another opportunity yourselves to analyze curriculum materials and to look at that curriculum example that's in your workbook and to see in that example how the purpose for each of the response that the curriculum says you are supposed to elicit. So how is that, uh, that example? Is it either um, designed to maintain processing or to check the accuracy processing? So do that now. Look in that workbook and go through those examples. And when you're done, you can come back and we'll talk about it. Okay, so let's talk about the curriculum example that you saw here. These first two bullets are teacher language. So neither, those don't involve any student response at all. And then here we have the uh, teacher asking where these sounds called, and the students give the response altogether. The signaling coral is a signal to give a coral response, and that is maintaining processing. So we're not checking accuracy. Coral responses aren't designed to do that. More teacher language, and again, maintaining processing by listening to coral response. 
Now in the second part of the lesson, the teacher is going to say some sounds and ask students to uh, give her some feedback about that. So that's the teacher language here. So let's look here. Is it a continuous sound or a stop sound? Show me your response card. Presumably teachers have two cards, one that has a continuous sound, maybe a little ziggly line under it showing it's a continuous sound. I'm imagining something like this with a C and a sort of little wiggly line underneath it. And then for the stop sign, maybe stop sound, maybe a little stop sign, and it has a little S for stop in it. And those are the two response cards. And in this case, then, you can now see those better. And so now the students hold up the one that best matches uh, the type of sound it is. In this case, it would be, uh, as it can be a continuous sound, they hold that up. And then, this is a great opportunity then, and that's a good way to check accuracy processing that you can see everybody's response cards. Finally, it says here, tell your partner why. And presumably the teacher is going to walk around and make sure that she is or he is um, uh, actually looking at uh, the student, listening to the students that she, he, she is most concerned about. So that will get that um, partner response. It's really good as a partner response because anytime you ask a why question that requires students to do a little more thinking and discussing, um, that's, this is a good opportunity to do that. In this case, it's actually pretty simple because the teacher's been really clear about this. I still think it's a good opportunity to turn and talk because it's a way to check accuracy processing. I will tell you, though, that actually this is a modification of the lesson. So this was not actually in the original lesson. It's actually more core response built in here. We decided for the purpose of demonstrating, it would be good to change things, but also because I actually believe pretty strongly that what we designed here may be a more effective way of doing this because it's going to be more effective in terms of checking accuracy processing. Teacher can do that better by a, being able to listen in. It's not going to take any more time to do it the way that we've designed it if we do it speedily, and I think we can. Um, but I think this is a good example of how, again, in a curriculum example, you might have to change things in order to improve the quality of the explicit instruction. I think in general, this is a good example of, a con of an explicit instruction lesson. You can see ways in which it could probably be improved. So now let's look at, again, at an, a real video example. Again, you get to watch our friend Mr. Kearns here. Um, and, uh, and so again, in this real video example, we want to focus on the purpose for each of the responses that's elicited from the students. This is a continuation of the same lesson with sixth graders on uh, uh, Ellis Island and uh, some vocabulary and concepts related to that. So look at this and determine whether students are maintain teachers maintaining accuracy or checking accuracy of student processing. And we'll come back together. Here's the video. I'll step away, watch it, and we'll come back together, and we will discuss it. There's one word that's really important that we've already kind of talked about before, and that word is immigrant. What's the word? Immigrant. That's immigrant, right. An immigrant is a person who moves to a new country permanently. Let's say that all together. A person who moves to a new country permanently. What does permanently mean? Tell your partner what permanently means. All right, who wants to tell me what permanently means? In the green shirt. Forever. So if you move to a new country, if you're an immigrant, do you go for a couple of weeks? No, you go for like the rest of your life, right? When you're an immigrant, you move to a new country permanently, forever, like you were saying. Good. What was your name? Julia. Julia, thanks. That was great. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple examples, and I want you to tell me if these are examples of immigrants, all right? So you're going to be thumbs up if it's an example of an immigrant, and thumbs down if it's not. But don't do it right away. I'm going to show you the example. I want you to think. And then I'll say, go, when I want you to do thumbs up or thumbs down, okay? So when I put up the example, are you going to do thumbs up, thumbs down? No, you're going to wait until I say go, right? Okay. Here's the first example. Someone who visits the country of Spain for a month. Think about it. Is that an immigrant? Go. I see thumbs down. Tell the person next to you why is that not an immigrant? Okay. So, uh, well, should I give myself some credit here? Yeah, I think it's a pretty good lesson. I think that hopefully you'll agree that there's some nice examples here of maintaining processing, checking accuracy. So you had your workbook, you had the script of the lesson, and presumably you put in some M's and C's to indicate maintaining and checking accuracy processing. The, that section started off with a couple examples of maintaining processing and what kind of ways I maintain processing. Presumably you said core response, and that's basically what I did. I didn't use any other methods there. 
I checked accuracy in a couple of ways, and I did this multiple times. And uh, so you have that in your book. I'll just kind of say what it is. I use the partner work as one way to check accuracy processing. And one thing that I did there that's really critical is I walked to the different class, uh, different pairs in the class to check in to see how particular pairs of students were doing with this content. And I knew, based on my experience working with this class, that it would be imperative to work with the particular pairs that I did. The other thing that you saw me do in there was to do some thumbs up, thumbs down to uh, have students indicate whether or not they thought it was an example of an immigrant or not. And make another good example of a case when I can scan the room and see. You saw also I gave a very, very quick explanation of how to do thumbs up, thumbs down. That was the first time I'd done that with that class. And so if I had um, been working with this class on that concept before, I would not have done that so quickly. But again, you can see there I'm using the thumbs up, thumbs down to get students to, uh, to show, to check accuracy of student processing. And I was able to see in that lesson that students were quite accurate in their processing. So some good examples of those things there. So I think you can agree that there's some quality of that lesson that does meet our criteria for a list responses in terms of it well it does it has, serves the two different purposes of list and responses so this is maybe the most exciting part for you for for me I may not get to see you actually do this but with this wrap-up now you're gonna have an opportunity to show how well you've been able to process this content Throughout this module, or this part of the module, you've seen us elicit responses in a variety of ways. We've asked you to do things in the workbook to sort of show that you are, one, maintaining processing and also checking your own accuracy of processing. Perhaps the person who's doing this module with you has sort of guided you through that, through the instructor of this uh, course has, has set that up for you. Um, if not, you've hopefully checked your own accuracy and I've given you the answers to help you do that. Now our goal is for you to do the independent part of this to show your understanding with a discussion board post and a quiz. Let me describe how these things will work. First, in terms of discussion board posts, here are the criteria for how to do a good discussion board post. You've likely seen these before. You may want to review these uh, guidelines for posting on the discussion board. You can pause the video now to look at this. They'll also be in your workbook. Let me describe the actual activity. You're going to give an example of how you might elicit a response to either maintain processing or check accuracy of processing. My recommendation to you would be to use either a lesson you've recently done or a lesson you intend to do soon. It might be a good idea to focus on what you intend to do soon, thinking forward to the uh, journal entry you're going to be doing, the lesson you're going to be executing, and the discussion you will have with the coach who will be helping you. You want to include in your uh, example for your peers uh, the learning outcome and context information so they understand the context in which this lesson is occurring uh, so they won't be confused about why you're doing what you're doing when you elicit those responses. Clearly, importantly, don't include that purpose. The goal for your peers is to be able to ex explain why they think it is one of these two. So if you tell them the answer, they won't be able to show their own understanding of the content. You'll be able to evaluate their understanding. You also do the same thing for others. You look at their responses and evaluate their understanding of the content, your own understanding of the content by evaluating their responses and uh, getting feedback from them through the discussion board. It's a nice opportunity to have some dialogue to determine how well you all understand this content. Then for the quiz, you're going to create, uh, complete this quiz to demonstrate how well you understand this part of the module. You can watch the quiz answer video when you're done to see how I would explain the answers to these questions. But be sure to do the quiz entirely first um, because it's going to give you an opportunity to make sure that you understand. Hopefully, because we've had all these opportunities to solicit responses and you've done even the discussion board, which should solidify your understanding because your peers can help you correct any misunderstandings you have, we hope you'll do very well on this quiz. So good luck with the quiz. When, you, when you're finished and your instructor gives you the opportunity, you can watch the video or they can discuss it with you to help you understand those things. So go ahead and take the quiz.